We had um, an L we had Landau Ginsburg model is um, a space a, a scheme. Just remind you or stack X on which we have this R charge so that we got graded so that we got a Z graded category rather than a um, rather than a Z2 graded category on um, which C star acts and minus one acts trivially and um, and so we can declare OX of one shifted by one is by definition the trivial line bundle OX um, with the, the R charge acting with weight one. And then we had W, which was an invariant section of, well, a section of OX of two. And maybe to, to give you a sense of, of, of what we're driving at with this. So our favorite examples, so the examples that were relevant to Orlov's theorem on, uh, on de derived categories of hypersurfaces is if I let F be a section of OPN of D, then we could either take, there, there, there are two examples. One is if I, if let's have X be C to the N plus two with, um, with coordinates X naught up to XN and P on which mod C star acting with these weights that you've seen in Ed's talks, one and minus D. And um, the R charges are like this, zero on the X's and two on, on, on the P's. Well, we could either take X minus the, uh, oh, and sorry, W is gonna P, be P times F. That's an invariant function. And, and you're already starting to meet several different quotients of this. Um, one is X minus the XI's equals zero mod C star. This turns into just the total space of O minus D with the function W is PF. So, so yesterday in Ed's lecture, you met something like this. Um, so you could think of if I have um, if I have the projection map from the total space of O minus D down to PN. Here's PN. Here's the total space up here. Then what is really happening? F is a section is a section of pi star O of D. And P is the tautological section of pi star O minus D, which just at a point in a fiber, right, so, so this is tautological. This was F. And so W is PF is a, is a function. So this is what I said yesterday about a section of O of D determining a function on O minus D. This is another way to, oh, I didn't mean to switch those. Another way to describe it in terms that are closer to what you did the other day. And on the other hand, if I could take, if I could delete P equals zero and mod out C star, you can, you've seen that this is the same as C to the N plus one mod ZD with coordinates X naught up to XN. Right, and so Ed is, is telling you about how to go back and forth 
between these two sides, uh, between these two different quotients, especially when d equals n plus 1. But that's right. So then we also had um, a curved um, dg sheaf is a is a C star R equivariant sheaf um, F with some D from F to F shifted by 1 such that D squared is um, W times the identity on F. And this is what we saw yesterday. And if F is locally free, we call it a matrix factorization. Factorization. And so it's, it's, so, so uh, the category of graded matrix factorizations from Monday, and which was essentially Orlov's definition of a matrix factorization, I claim this is the same as the category of matrix factorizations on the second space. Second space. In in some very straightforward way. So if I have, um, um, remember we had maybe E naught was some sum of O P N of 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 some. Uh, I'll use different notations than I did last time. Uh, e one was a sum of OPN of some LIs, and we had a map from E0 to E1 to E0 twisted by D given by matrices M and N. And then, of course, NM is F. This, this corresponds to well, let's take E to be E naught plus E one shifted by one. So th this was this was in in Monday's setup, and by the second space, I mean that one up there, where you delete P equals zero. We'll take that one. We'll take D to be, um, ah, sorry, I think I need minus 1 here, to be M and PN. I think I'm pretty sure that goes from E to E shifted by 1. This was All right, so here I had M and there I had P N. Right, because P is a section of O of minus D shifted by two. Is that all right? And then d squared is pf pf, which is w. w. Okay, so so this is this is how to take 
this more comfortable feeling Orlov story and put it into this stacky story that is starting to connect to what Ed is talking about. Well, and I, I haven't yet explained, in, this, in the affine case, I said we can just use vector bundles. Well, okay, let, let me remind you of the HOM complex. So we introduced Xi Hom from EF. So if these are curved DG sheaves, then this is, and this is a complex. Let me point out, by the way, that because minus one acts trivially, any curved DG sheaf you can split into an even part and an odd part. When we took W equals zero and let C star, the R charge act trivially everywhere, but then we got a whole, our sheaf split into graded pieces and we got a complex. In general, when we have a W around and, and more interesting things happening, well, minus one still acts trivially, so we still get an even piece and an odd piece. So that, that's how you would go back from matrix factorizations there to Orlov's story. Right, so we introduced this. And we said we, we want to make a DG category with, with whose HOM complex is R gamma of the sheaf HOM complex, All right? And if X, so if, if E is a matrix factorization, um, this is okay because then it's acyclic for curly HOM. Um, it's uh, even better if X is affine, right? Because then, then you don't have to derive global sections either, right? Um, so that was, that was what we said last time. But what if we don't want to be affine and we don't want to, and we want to embrace sheafy matrix factorizations, curved DG sheaves, and not just vector bundling matrix factorization? So in general, we follow this. So in general, um, how um, should we invert quasi-isomorphisms? And, and what should a quasi-isomorphism even be? And this is, this is again due to Orlov. Oh, by the way, someone asked me where should you read this story because Orlov's paper looks quite different from what we're saying. And Ed and I will try to come up with some, some decent references that are not just section two of every paper Ed has ever written. <laughs> just as, just as the, the, the canonical reference for semi-orthogonal decompositions is section two of every paper by Kuznetsov. Also, that, okay. Okay, so how do we invert quasi-isomorphism? So given, well, let's see. In, in, in the homotopy category of chain complexes, suppose you have an exact sequence. Um, zero to the first chain complex, to the second chain complex, um, to the last chain com complex, to zero. And an exact sequence term-wise. Right, so this is 
is a sequence of chain maps such that each, you know, so vertically we've got chain complexes going, and horizontally it's just saying, we're saying it's exact. We um, um, define the totalization um, to be the, the cone of the cone of the cone. So I'm going to take the cone on, on this map. the iterated cone. Um, so if I have cone of E1 to E2, and then that will map to, remember that's a complex, that will map to E3, and I can take the cone of that. You just do that as many times as you need. And so the result will be one complex whose terms are the sums of those terms all with funny shifts and whose differential is made out of um, the, the chain maps and the differentials. Okay. Well, then this is, this is an acyclic complex, and moreover, every acyclic complex arises this way, right? And so the derived category right, the derived category was just the homotopy category say D of A with whatever boundedness sort of thing you want, was um, the Verdier quotient. So Sasha talked briefly about this, but I'll remind you a little bit. Um, the homotopy category mod totalizations. Right, so this means i.e., you invert um, morphisms. I'll write it over here. So you invert morphisms. Whose, uh, whose cones are, are totalizations, or let's say are in the thick subcategory generated by totalizations. So you take totalizations of, of exact sequences, you take things homotopy equivalent to them, you take direct summands, importantly. Right, i.e., and the thick category, ca categories generated, this is the same as acyclic complexes. Right? So, i.e., you, right, you know that a, com a morphism is a quasi-isomorphism if and only if its cone is acyclic. So, i.e., you invert quasi isomorphisms. So with matrix factorizations, or with um, with possibly sheafy matrix factorizations, you do the same. Right, so we had this Homotopy, cat, we had this category of curved DG sheaves, which we're, we were thinking of as being like complexes. We have maps between them. Or you should check that if I take the cone of such a map, 
that it's uh, that it's again a, a curved DG sheet. That cones are just behave the way you want in this category, even though d squared is w. Um, so now, yes, please. It, right, exactly. So that doesn't mean anything, but being in the thick subcategory generated by totalizations, that is, that is meaningful. So, so, um, so we don't, we, we can't say a cyclic, but we can say totalization. So whenever you have a short exact sequence of curved DG sheaves, right, of matrix factorization, sheafy matrix factorization, you can make its totalization. And, and the, the right definition is to say we're going to kill all those. We're going to make all those equal to zero. We're going to make any morphism whose cone is isomorphic to a sum end of one of those. Um, we're going to make those isomorphisms. So you take. And, okay, I, I was making a DG category and then I suddenly said Verdier quotient, which makes it sound like I'm in a triangulated category. So you could either take the homotopy category of matrix, factor, of matrix factorizations with this naive HOM complex and say that's a triangulated category and I'm going to do this triangulated thing to it. Or you could try to make Verdier quotients work on the DG level, which you can do, but we don't want to do today. Let's have an example. Let's have X be C three mod Z three. Right, so this is I'm I'm gonna talk about my what's apparently my favorite example is an elliptic curve with the point. Zero, zero, one on it. And so in here we have Y, which is, so remember we could write F was XQ1 plus YQ2, where F was the cubic cutting out this elliptic curve. Q1 and Q2 are, are quadratics. So Y is just going to be the set F equals zero. And then here I'm going to have the line x equals y equals 0. So, so why, is the, why is the z3 equivariant OK? Um, this equation is z3 invariant. Right? Remember, z3 was given by a root of unity on x, y, yeah. This was given by roots of 1 acting on x, y, z. Right, so both of these sets are z3 invariant, and so that's all right. And then we can take the ideal of this line in y. This this corresponds, this has to do with, um, this is, you should compare the line bundle OC of minus the point. Right, if I, if I took the same thing on A3 and uh, and took the associated module on P2, I would get that line. So maybe I should draw this picture once. This one. We want to go back and forth between the outline and the projected pictures. So 
So we can have we can have two different matrix factorizations, right? We could take the sheafy well, a curve DG sheaf DG sheaf um, this I'm going to call this I. Um, and d equals zero, or we could have a matrix factorization, which was, um, I'm going to write it this way and, and hope that you don't rebel. O minus one squared comes from O minus two plus O minus three by this matrix that we write all the time comes from O minus one squared if if you would rather work on the chart where um, so if you prefer C4 with coordinates x, y, z, and p minus p equals zero. Uh, mod, right, the other model that we drew of this, 1, 1, 1, minus 3. Then you just need to stick a p in here. Right. Yeah, exactly. So th that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm driving at. P. In this picture, P is a section of um, O minus 3 shifted by 2. Right? And so that P makes this an o, o minus 1 instead of an O minus 4. Um, is it still there? Yeah, going back and forth between that picture and, and this picture. Um, or here, when in, in this case, if you if you look in this orbifold picture, then O of three is just O, right, because okay. So these are not the same object in the naive category of curve DG sheaves, or the homotopy category, curve DG sheaves. Um, I claim that these become, so I claim that these become isomorphic after inverting quasi-isomorphisms. And again, what is, what is a quasi-isomorphism? So a quasi-isomorphism is a thing whose cone is a totalization, or is in the thick subcategory generated by totalizations. Shall I call this M and this N? Yes? Let's work in the homotopy category. It, it can work at DG level, but let's let's be in the homotopy category. I, uh, you can see I'm really of two minds. This, this place is so much cleaner to work as far as actually writing down equations. This one feels less, I mean, it's just an orbifold, right? Let, let's make a choice. Let's. Uh, Let's work here and not, and not there. Yeah. Right, so let, let's see why these, be, why, why the, there's going to be an obvious morphism between these. And I want to say why it's a quasi-isomorphism, right? The, so the claim is that 
the obvious map between these is a quasi isomorphism. So we have O minus 1 squared. Uh, let's do it this way O minus 2 plus O minus 3. This maps to I just via the usual X or maybe Y and X. These go back and forth via M and N. Here I want to put, so what's the cone? So I, here, here's a, a short exact sequence. Oh, there's a zero here. So here's a short exact sequence of curved DG sheaves. So here I'm going to put the identity map. Here I'm going to put O minus 2 plus O minus 3. This map is going to be M. Uh, sorry, this should have been PM, shouldn't it? And here, let's see, if I want it to com commute this way, I'd better put 1 there. And I'd better put W, which is PF, there. So I'm, I'm being kind of sloppy about the shifts. Because P always involves the shift by 2 that you lose your mind. Right, so this is a short exact sequence of curved DG sheaves. So what I really mean when I write one of these sort of two-term up and down things is I mean this plus this shifted by minus 1 with an endomorph with this sort of off-diagonal endomorphism like that. Right, so... Um, So after killing totalizations, uh, well, this complex becomes zero. Right? This, the totalization of this complex becomes zero. And so I claim that the, the cone of this map, of, of this map here, purple map. Sorry to the people watching at home. Purple looks the same as white. I'd be shocked if anyone watching at home makes it this far into the second week. Right. The cone of that becomes isomorphic to um, the first the, to uh, this complex, this matrix factorization. Right. The, the cone of this map, for just sort of the same last week kind of reasons, is isomorphic already in the homotopy category to this thing. Uh, no, that's not true. After we kill, after we kill totalizations, this, the cone of this is the totalization of these three things. That's, that's what follows from last week's methods. The cone of this purple map is the totalization of this three-term business. And so...
No, that, no, I'm saying something stupid. If I take the cone of this map mapping to the cone of that map, that's something that gets killed. Okay, well, okay. exercise, understand this state. This is. But now I claim that the, 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 um, the left-hand side there is contractible, i.e., it's, it's isomorphic to zero in the homotopy category. Right, because um, I have some, some vector bundle E going back and forth like this. Let me even, let me even write it this way. So I need to write a homotopy between the identity map and zero. So I'll just put one there and zero there. So when I kill totalizations, the effect is that that cone becomes, yes? Please. So the example that makes was written down, you can see that, that in any category of matrix factorization, you might be tempted to write down a really obvious matrix factorization, so there's one in one direction and there's a W in the other direction. But the thing is contractible. So there are no, there are never any obvious matrix Thanks. Soon, I think we'll talk about the if if W is PF, then there is there is a the matrix factorization P and F is 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 interesting on one side and not interesting on the other side, right? Okay. So so that was that was a long discussion. So that so remember we had our, our favorite example was X was C four with coordinates x, y, z, and p, and we deleted p equals zero, we got Orlov's category, you know, mod c star with weights one, 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 minus three. And we also got sheafy matrix factorizations. Not just not just locally free ones, and we said, what should quasi isomorphisms be? It's this sort of very dry thing, but it you can do it, and that's also Orlov's idea. Um, so on the other side, delete x equals y equals z equals zero, and and so the the what we're driving at, so eventually, the matrix factorizations there will be the same as the derived category of the, um, of the elliptic curve, of the cubic curve. In P2. So we, can we want to compare the derived category of P2 to Orlov's category of matrix factorizations. And Sheafy, having Sheafy matrix, factoriz matrix factorizations around is going to be absolutely crucial. And, and this, this equivalence is something called Knurrer. Let me read it, write, write it so you can read it. So that's what I want to talk about for the last 18 or so minutes. 
I want to set that up. Maybe I'll give you the statement. Statement is going to be x is going to be smooth over c. And in our example, x is going to be pn. Um, D in X is going to be a divisor. And we want, no, I'm going to call it Y, otherwise I have to write D of D all the time and you'll rebel. Um, and we're, we're going to get a functor from the derived category of Y to the derived category of matrix factorizations but so let, let's let, um, well, on O of minus Y, let's let S be the section, or let's let, yeah, S be the section of OX of Y that cuts out Y. And then on the total space of O minus Y, we have this function um, W is PS. And the map is going to be as follows. If this is x and this is the total space of O minus d, and inside here we have y, um, so we could take this total space restricted to y. I guess that's just the conormal bundle of y in it. That maps down to y via pi, and it also embeds into the total space. So I'll draw it in a color here. So sitting over y, we just have the restriction of this vector bundle. And I'll call that inclusion. And the map is going to be i lower star after pi upper star. Yeah, so this is this is um, this is homotopy category of matrix factorizations of, of curved DG sheaves. And then you invert quasi isomorphisms. Right. And by the by the way, the R charge as I said before, C star R acts on the base trivially on the fibers with weight two. Right, so I, I take a complex of sheaves on Y, which I rec regard as a matrix factorization of zero, if you like. I pull it up and include, and now I have a matrix factorization on, a matrix factorization of zero on X, but it's supported on this locus where W is zero. So it's also a matrix factorization of W. So I, I need to explain this to you. But this is, this is the statement that we're going for. And Always unclear how many names need to be put on the board at this point. Knurr did his thing in the in the eighties. Um, this has been proved by Shipman and Isik and Orlov. So let's try to understand it. So let's understand the statement and why it's true for the origin in A1. Right. So, so what is this total space? This total space 
is A2. Let's say this was the x direction. This is x equals 0. And let's, the fiber direction is P. And now W is Px. And we claim that the functor from D of a point to D of A2 with W equals Px that sends O of the point to O, the Sheafy matrix factorization, O of x equals 0 right here. But this is an equivalence. And then this is just some global version of that. And I did a divisor and a line bundle. You could have done a complete intersection and a sum of line bundles. You could have done, you know, a vector bundle and some section that cuts out a thing of the right co-dimension. But it, it all, it's all just fine. Um, but I want to focus on this very down to earth thing, especially because that's the one we want. And so x has r charge 0 and p has r charge 2. But at some point, you want to sort of stop talking about r charge. r charge means the weight of that c star acting. So I want to take this Sheafy matrix factorization and calculate its self x and see that they're the same as the self x of O of a point. Of O P equals zero as the matrix factorization. O x equals zero, excuse me. O P equals zero is also very interesting, but I, I not confident that I'm going to get to it in this hour. All right, so first we need to replace it. You know, how do you ever compute x? You resolve something by vector bundles. So first, we resolve by vector bundles. And this is going to be very similar to what we just did with what we just did here, only less detail, or less, you know, fewer moving parts. So we have this matrix factorization, this Sheafy matrix factorization like this, going back and forth to zero. And I want to resolve this thing, O, So that's a short exact sequence. And here, I want to put the identity there. And I want this one to be, my friend, the contractible matrix factorization. And so here, I should put x and p. Right, so, so the claim, so as before, the, the left is contractible. So the middle is quasi-isomorphic to the right-hand side. Right, 
took a short exact. So I'm saying I'm resolving this sheafy matrix factorization by this traditional matrix factorization, this bundling matrix factorization by saying I have this map here. And how do I show that it's a quasi-isomorphism? I show that the cone is contractible. Yes? Oh, um, yeah, if I split, right, so what this really means, I'll write it over here. Right, what I really mean is I have a short exact sequence. the D is 1 and W here, D is X and P, and here D is 0. Right, be, again, because that R charge acted trivially, every R invariant thing splits into a sum of an even part and an odd part. Sorry, because the minus one in the R torus acts trivially, I can split it into an even part and an odd part. Um, So actually, if I let's give these names. Sorry, sorry to the cameraman. Let's call this E and call this F. So in the derived category of A2 with the superpotential, um, E is quasi-isomorphic to F. E is isomorphic to F because this is contractible. So let's compute sheaf hom from E to F, which we could also call E dual tensor F. So E dual, maybe in that picture, is O plus O shifted by 1 with uh, the transposed D and we tensor with F, which is the same as tensor with O of X equals zero. So I get O of x equals 0 plus O of x equals 0 shifted by 1 with D is now going to be 0, 0, P, 0. So I could think of that, that's just a complex, right? Ox equals 0 maps by a p to Ox equals 0. And the co right, it's injective. The co-kernel is just O 
x equals p equals 0. Right, so this is just a copy of my field. So I, I claim that this x algebra is c and then a bunch of zeros. I'm slightly annoyed that it looks like my c is in degree 1 when it should be in degree 0. Of course, the thing needs to have a hom to itself. Let's trust that if I weren't standing in public here, so this is just C not the origin. Right. All right, so this, this matrix factorization formalism tells you that, of course, if I were just interested in the derived category of A2, this line would have some, some self x, right? It could move around. Um, but as a matrix factorization, um, a different thing happens. It knows about this w that's around, and it can't move. So with one minute, of course, I'm not going to prove the real theorem. I'm a, let, let me return to this next time. So let, let me, yeah, let me stop here. I'm saying this is a family version of the calculation we just did. Um, and you have an awful lot of exercises from Ed and Sasha and from previous days built up, so I'm going to let you keep working on those.